Okay, great. Welcome to the second lecture. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Miles, who his video is uh, just a second, Miles. Your video is not yet here. Let me put it up there, actually. Good. Now, okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Miles. Uh, we tried two years ago to bring him to Vienna, but it was not successful. <laughs> and we are very happy to have him this year, although not in person, but it's very it's still very uh, nice to have him uh, giving us a series of lectures about imaging with entangled photons. Uh, so uh, Miles is a Royal Society Research Professor and also holds the Kelvin Chair of Natural Philosophy in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Glasgow. Uh, his team uh, covers a wide spectrum from blue sky research to applied commercial development funded by combination of government, charity, and industry. He is currently the principal investigator of Quantic, the UK Center of Excellence for Research, Development, and Innovation in Quantum Enhanced Imaging, which brings together eight universities with more than 40 industry partners. He's a fellow of uh, both the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Royal Society. Uh, quite recently in 2021, uh, he has won the uh, he won the op optics prize of the of the European Physical Society, and in 2019, uh, he has won the Rumford Medal of the Royal uh, Society. So I hope that was correct. Um, so let me before my start, let me uh, tell this that let me tell you that if you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, then we will bring you a microphone so that Miles, of course, can hear the question. And please, if you have questions in the middle of the talk, don't hesitate to ask. Um, yeah, from my side, it's okay, Miles. Yeah, Wait. absolutely. I'll, I'll leave my chat box open. So I've got my chat box open on the screen. So I should be able to see comments and things as they come in. And if they're easy ones, I might even be able to answer them. But we'll see how it goes. Great, thanks. Right. OK, well, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really, really, really sorry, actually, that, that I'm not going to be there. I, I sort of really enjoy summer schools in general, not, not least because I'm sure when I go to them, I learn more <laughs> than, than, than by listening than I certainly do by, by speaking. But um, what, what I've done is uh, with these slides is to, is to put together, I'm going to try and use some various aspects of research, mainly I'll be honest, my own past research to explain some general principles within the context of, um, of quantum imaging and, and using, as we just heard, entangled light sources to do, to do imaging. Um, and so I, I'm going to start off uh, probably, to, I'm lecturing twice today, so sort of um, I'll, it's really one lecture in two halves. And what I want to talk about is what is frequently called in the literature ghost imaging. Um, probably the, the title is more, well, the title is certainly very exciting, make, makes you think about what, 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 what's doing. Uh, and I guess the reason why it's called ghost imaging is related to quantum spooky action at a distance. And so the sort of the ghost is meant to pick up on the spooky bit. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that in the main, what people call um, ghost imaging or quantum ghost imaging is very rarely a proof of quantum entanglement. So it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't cause Einstein to lose any sleep. But what it is, is a rather nifty use of entanglement. But if we think of entanglement as being um, correlations in position and momentum, whereby one can measure either uh, at will and of course, that leads to the whole EPR paradox. In the main, it is sufficient within ghost imaging experiments. One is only utilizing either the 
um, correlations in position between the two down converted photons or the correlations or the anti-correlations in momentum between the two down converted photons. Very rarely does one need both. And that's why it's not really a proof of entanglement. So before going into talking about using entangled sources for doing imaging, what I want to talk about is purely, purely classical. So I want to try and emphasize that the, the correlations we're talking about need not be of a quantum origin. They can just be um, of a classical origin. And so here I put up a slide. It's just a schematic slide. Any number of, um, you could read any number of authors papers, Bob Boyd, Luigi Luigiotto in Italy, Lots of excellent work on using classical light sources to do, let's say, correlated imaging. And, and how might one think about going about that? So we could start off with a light source. We could start off with a light diffuser. It could be a spatial light modulator. It could be a glass of milk. It could be a rotating glass screen. The important thing is I'm going to generate some random pattern in the light. Many, many, many photons in that pattern. Uh, and then I'm going to take a beam splitter and create identical copies of that, let's call it a speckle pattern. One of those copies goes off to the CCD, so I know what the pattern is. And the other copy goes off and illuminates the object. And then the important thing is I measure the backscattered light or the transmitted light through the object with a single pixel, a large, sometimes called a bucket detector. It's called a bucket detector because it's just basically very large. So a very large single pixel make, re reveals no information about the spatial distribution. So it's like using a CCD and just adding all the pixels together. I get a single number, which tells me the amount of backscattered light. That backscatter will go up and down as the random pattern changes. And the more the random pattern looks like the object, the higher the backscattered signal will be. And if the random pattern looks nothing like the object, the lower the backscattered signal could be. And one can at least conceptually imagine through some kind of matrix algebra that if I know what the pattern is and I know what the signal is, then if I go through many, many, many patterns, it is possible for me to deduce what the object shape is, because I've got this whole series of patterns and um, I can work out what the object is. Nothing, nothing quantum, nothing spooky, nothing goes slight other than, the, other than the object in this case. And that's all absolutely fine. And now I can make a change to this because I go, well, actually, I'm not going to use a glass of milk or a rotating ground glass screen to generate my random pattern. I'm going to use maybe a digital micro mirror, like a, a data projector, uh, maybe a liquid crystal equivalent of that, but some kind of programmable filter so that I can certainly generate a random pattern, but I know what that random pattern is because I, it is the pattern that I just told the thing to do. And therefore I can make this experimental system I have in front of me much, much simpler because I don't need to measure the pattern anymore because I know what it is. So I can remove the beam splitter, I can remove the CCD, and I can just choose to project onto the object a known pattern of light. Oh, oops, sorry, and that's, not, uh, did that, was that, um, I don't understand why there was, um, uh, right. Okay, and so here we have a schematic of what I'm trying to show. It is a, in this case, a data projector, uh, the kind that you might be using in the lecture theater you're in now. I don't know what kind of screen you've got. If it is a data projector, it probably includes a, um, um, a Texas instrument uh, chip, like the one in the figure there. And it's basically a, a whole array of tiny little mirrors and the mirror rotates one way or it flips the other way. And if it flips one way, you get light out. If it flips the other way, you don't get light out. And so it's possible for me to project onto the object a 
something that looks a bit like an ever-changing crossword puzzle. Um, I know every single one of those patterns. And actually, I can, with this kind of technology, project something of the order of 20,000 patterns every second. And um, we see here uh, essentially a schematic of doing exactly that. So I've got a light projector. I'm projecting a random pattern. I am then recording the single pixel, the photo detector, measuring the backscattered pattern. Uh, sorry, I've got some audio in the background. So you can see what happens. I've got these patterns. All I have to do is add the patterns together, but I multiply each of the patterns by the backscattered signal. When the pattern looks more like the object, I get a bigger signal, so I more heavily weight that pattern. When the pattern doesn't look like the object, I don't weight that pattern. And so one can imagine by adding up all of these different patterns together, one can reconstruct some kind of image. And that's what we're doing here. We're projecting patterns, experimental data, onto the, uh, the object. We're adding all the patterns together, but those patterns are weighted by the backscatter signal. And so this is just simply an example of using completely classical optics, classical uh, common sense to say, all I'm wanting to do, I'm relying on the fact that I've got a correlation effectively between the pattern that is in my computer memory and the pattern that is being projected onto the object. And so this is sometimes called computational ghost imaging. So that's just background. We're now going to go on to the topic of the, basically the summer school. I'm going to talk about using um, uh, entangled light sources or correlated light sources where my photons are generated two by two. And those photon pairs are correlated in the position at which they're created within the down conversion crystal. And they're anti-correlated in terms of their momentum. And if one wanted to read about the history of this work, one could do a lot worse than reading uh, papers by these two authors. So first of all, we've got Yan Wah Shi. I think most people would, would credit Yan Wah Shi as being the first person to talk about using um, entangled photon pairs in, 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 in this way. Uh, certainly the term ghost imaging comes in through their papers, picking up on the spooky aspect. I think a beautiful uh, explanation as to how the effect is both essentially can be mimicked or recreated classically is provided by Bob Boyd and his group. And I would recommend that FizRev letter paper at the bottom, Quantum and Classical Coincidence Imaging, published in, in, in 2004. Um, certainly, that's a beautiful comparison between the, 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 let's call it the quantum or the entangled light source and the classical light source implementation. Uh, I've just put up another series of, uh, of papers and, and similar here that one likes to pick up. And, and in particular, I, I pick out that the work from Brazil. There's a fantastic paper by Munkin et al. down there published in 1998, uh, uh, talking about how the, uh, the, the pump uh, has a role to play in, in terms of, um, in terms of the, the, the effects that one gets. So I'll just leave that up. Let's move on. I'm going to talk now about some experimental work in our group and try and pick up on some of these things. And, and in particular, um, most of my lectures now are going to talk about the role that cameras might play within quantum imaging, or more generally, the role that cameras can play within, within quantum optics. And we're going to look at a number of different camera technologies and see the kind of experiments that one can do with, for example, uh, a time-gated intensified camera uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, a, uh, an electron multiplying CCD. And finally, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about a, a wonderful new camera, which has just been released by, uh, by Hamamatsu, it's scientific CMOS camera, in, in which they can count the number of pixels, sorry, count the number of photons that arrive in each, 
pixel. The signal to noise is so good, you can tell the difference between two photons and three photons, or one photon and zero photons, or as we will see shortly, well, by the end of the week, one photon and two photons. So we're going to talk about the use of cameras. So before we talk about the use of cameras, let's just have a little recap on the down conversion process itself, a very a cartoon here. So I, I, I'm sure all of you have played with different down conversion systems. Uh, our, our own work here in Glasgow invariably is based upon uh, BBO, beta barium borate. We are invariably using a pump laser at 355 nanometers. So that's frequency tripled YAG. Our pump laser is sometimes um, uh, mode locked, and therefore we've got a rep rate of about uh, 100, and 100 megahertz. Uh, it's sometimes CW, but invariably we're effectively using it as a CW source, whether it's mode locked or not. Or not. Um, so we're typically uh, generate, you know, using about 100 milliwatts of uh, UV pump beam. We are typically uh, collimating that beam into several millimeters in diameter uh, and then illuminating a beta barium borate crystal somewhere between one and three millimeters thick. We'll talk about this later. And from that, we are producing uh, down converted photon pairs. In this case, the, the 355 generating uh, the photon pairs at 710 nanometers. We are typically filtering those with a 10 nanometer wide interference filter. So we're, we're, we're generating photon pairs uh, between 705 and, and 715. And that is typically what we are doing. And then let's just recap what properties those photon pairs uh, might have. And so first of all, let's just talk about uh, their, um, their, the position. So I've got this, uh, um, a uh, beta barium borate crystal, typically 10 millimeters in, 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 in square aperture. We are illuminating it with a pump beam, typically three millimeters in diameter. And we're now going to at least ask ourselves the concept about, well, where, where, what, where are these photon pairs created? And, and you know, if I was at least hypothetically able to make some kind of microscope that was going to watch these 710 uh, nanometer photon pairs being created, then clearly they can be created anywhere within the diameter of the pump beam. You know, sometimes they're created at the top, sometimes they're created at the bottom. But what I would observe is that both photons in the pair are created in very closely the same position. It, it transpires when I say same position, that position becomes more the same as the crystal gets thinner. So as the crystal gets thinner, the correlation between those two, the position correlation between those two photons gets stronger and stronger. And, and for very thin crystals, that position correlation between the photons approaches an optical wavelength. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that position correlation later in some more detail. So, um, it is also true that in a sort of, um, that as well as the photons being generated in the same position, they are generated with opposite transverse momentum. And, and that's just because in the down conversion process, we need to conserve two physical quantities. Uh, the first of those physical quantities is energy. And so that is why one incoming photon at 355 produces two outcoming photons at 710. Energy is conserved. If, if one of those photons through phase matching should go to 700, the other one would then go to 720, uh, roughly. So uh, energy is always conserved. It's also true that the momentum is conserved. The momentum is conserved both axially and, and laterally. So assuming that the pump beam comes in on the axis of the optical system, uh, then when my photons come out, they actually come out over a range of different angles, as we will discuss later. That range of angles depends on the crystal thickness. If the crystal is very thin, the photons will, the down converted photons will come out over a wide range of angles. 
Um, but if one photon comes out to the left, the other photon comes out to the right. If one photon goes up, the other photon will go down. And so essentially we can think about, in this case, the two beams, in this case, the phase matching arranged such that the two beams are separated and they come out in slightly different angles. But when I now hypothetically bring my magnifying glasses in and I start looking at where those photons were created, as I've said already, those photons are created effectively in pairs in a random position, but any one pair creation happens at the same position within a diameter defined by the size of the pump beam. And indeed, if one wants to use such a source for imaging or ghost imaging, then one needs to have a large diameter pump beam because one wants to have an image which effectively comprises of more than one pixel at the end of the day. You need the photons to be generated in different positions such that one can illuminate the whole object. So the basic idea within ghost imaging, therefore, unsurprisingly, is that one will put the object in one of these down converted beams and one will put a camera or a detector in the other down converted beam. Now, the fact that the photons are correlated means that you record, let's say, the position of the photon on the camera. You know, without ever having to measure it, that the object will also have been illuminated by a photon, and that photon will be in the same relative position. And then you can simply choose to measure whether that photon was transmitted or not. So it's a yes, no decision in terms of is the photon transmitted through the object? If yes, where was the photon? Well, the camera can tell you where the photon was and therefore one can slowly but surely piece together an image of the object photon by photon. Now, just as a little aside here, when we started off classically, we were talking about you know, taking a, a speckle pattern and splitting it in two with a beam splitter such that I had identical copies. Clearly that only works if I've got lots of photons to start off with. If I've only got one photon in the beam and I put a beam splitter in, it will go one way or the other. There will be no copies of patterns. If I send two photons in, then there's a 50-50 chance they'll both go the same way anyway, but leaving aside Hong Mandel uh, dips and the like, which is also going to be a problem. So if nothing else, doing, it, doing this correlated imaging with photon pair sources allows me to do it with the minimum number of photons. I don't have to rely on sort of splitting patterns statistically. I know I will have one photon in one beam and one photon in the other beam, and they will be correlated due to the property of the down conversion source. So let us think, at least again, conceptually, about how we might do this. It's just basically what I've shown here already. We've got a light source, we've got spontaneous parametric down conversion, in our case, uh, BBO, but any, any, anything basically works. I am then re-imaging the plane of the crystal onto the object, and I am re-imaging the plane of the crystal onto, I've said a CCD camera, let's just call it a position measuring device that will tell me where the photon is. I know that the other photon will illuminate the object in the same position, and I can then measure whether that photon is backscattered or not with my bucket detector. After many, many, many photon pairs, one assumes that I can build up an accurate picture of the object. The object has been illuminated, um, but it has been illuminated by photons that I only know the position of because I have been able to measure the position of their correlated partner. I say correlated, not entangled, but correlated is important here. So let's think about how this was done initially. Initially, we can think of it as using the UV pump beam, as we've discussed already. We're generating our photon pairs. The plane of the crystal is imaged onto the object. And then a bucket detector simply collects every single photon that is transmitted. The original work didn't use any kind of um, um, camera. It used a scanning detector, scanning that detector in both X and Y. 
and then measuring the coincidence counts between the bucket detector and the scanning detector. And that coincidence count between the bucket detector and the scanning detector is effectively what gives me the intensity of the image pixel. And the position of that particular image pixel is given by the uh, position of the scanning detector. So these are the sort of original uh, measurements. So how, how might it be different? Uh, a sort of key to creative science in my book here, just keep on asking yourself, how can it be, how can it be different? What can I do differently? What would happen if I change that bit for that bit? Um, and I'm um, just gonna say that there's, a, there's a, quite a wide range of groups have I've set about using uh, cameras uh, in various different ways. Um, I've got, since we're in, since we're in Vienna, that the lovely paper by Robert Fickler from Anton Seilinger's group, um, actually looking at entanglement of, of, of OAM, but using a, a time-gated image intensified camera. Um, got the, the wonderful papers we'll see later by Breda et al, um, using um, uh, EMCCD, I think in that case, uh, to do shot, shot, sub, shot noise imaging. I put in a paper from our own group. Again, these are all papers sort of uh, um, 2010, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. And then also quite an old paper, but actually probably one of the first papers to look at characterizing entanglement using uh, cameras by Ian Wormsland's group here. Just a selection of papers from the past. And so what we're talking about, of course, is replacing your stereotypical um, SPAD detector, this is one from Perkin Elmer, um, you know, 25 microns or 50 microns active area, fiber coupled, uh, basically photon in, TTL or voltage pulse out. Um, dark point now is 100 dark counts a second, maximum count rate, perhaps 10 to the six, maybe a bit more. So you've got a dynamic range of about 10 to the four. Uh, quantum efficiency, 60%, something like that. And I, I'm talking about replacing that. The first camp type of camera we're going to look at is an intensified camera, by which I mean um, it, much lower quantum efficiency, probably due to the, the photocathode, 15% um, uh, if I'm lucky. Dark counts, actually, when the, when the gate time is short, the false event rate is incredibly low, maybe maybe one for every 2000 pixels in the image, maybe even better than that. Tens of Hertz frame rate, I can, you know, I can trigger the intensifier many times, a second, perhaps 50,000 times a second, but I'm gonna read out of the order of 10 frames or so. And then the number of pixels, well, I mean, it's not really, the, the resolution of the, the CCD array in the intensified camera. It's more like the bleed from the photocathode. So you've probably got something of the order of 256 by 256 meaningful different positions that one can see a single photon, but that single photon has to arrive at the same time that one gates, um, gates the intensifier. And if you just leave the intensifier switched on all the time, then your, your, your image is just going to be swamped by thermal, thermal events. You won't be able to see the single photons at all. So you're going to, you have to gate it uh, whether you wanted to or not. And so um, let's do that. Let's replace our scanning detector with, with, with a camera. Um, and why would I want to do that? Well, for a start, the system is now going to be actually a lot more efficient because with my scanning detector, I'm only going to pick up a count if my scanning detector, by good fortune, happens to overlap with where the photon happened to be. And so, you know, if I'm looking to create an image, let's say that's 32 by 32, that will be a thousand different pixels in the image. And so there's only a one in a thousand chance that my scanning detector will be in the right place. So if I make a ghost imaging system using a scanning detector, I'm going to have a massive inefficiency, a uh, sampling inefficiency due to the number of pixels in the image. I can get rid of that sampling inefficiency by using a camera because my camera is essentially a staring array. It can look at the whole field of view simultaneously at the same time. So that's good news and more than makes up for the 15% quantum efficiency compared to the 70% of the, um, of, of, of the single detector. So there's my camera. 
And, but there's a bit of a problem because how am I going to tell the camera when to take a picture? Well, the good news is, of course, I've got my bucket detector here. My bucket detector knows when to take a picture because it's going to record the photon. It's going to say, well, where, where did the part of the photon arrive? Let me have a look. And so essentially, it's almost like you're doing an AND operation or, already or a coincidence detection. The trigger on the camera is effectively the coincidence trigger. The downside is that you need to take this camera to take a picture at exactly the same time as this, this bucket detector records a click. So I've got some faster than light signaling challenge. Well, from a technology point of view, if not a quantum mechanics proof point of view, I can overcome that by introducing some kind of delay line in the camera arm, such that the electrical signal can get from the bucket detector to the trigger here in time to trigger the camera at exactly the right time to collect the photon from the delay line. And so that's there a, um, a setup uh, to do exactly that. Um, the delay line is a free space uh, delay line. It's not a fiber. Why is it a free space? Because I need it to preserve the image. Now, clearly, if I had a coherent fiber bundle, I could perhaps do that. Uh, quite difficult to do over the um, tens of meters required. Uh, so we went for a free space um, delay line. We were trying to introduce something like a 35 nanosecond delay um, such that the photons arrived at the ICCD uh, 35 nanoseconds after the, um, the bucket detector uh, signal uh, has been picked up. And if you get that delay right, one can and pick up a, um, an image. If you get that delay wrong, one doesn't pick up an image because the camera is gated and it triggers at the, the, the wrong time. This is uh, an image collated over about um, 50,000 um, uh, photon events. Uh, and that, in, in this case, was probably about 10 seconds of, uh, of data acquisition. Uh, hopefully, I will play this video. And that is uh, effectively uh, showing you the single photon events, the gated single photon events adding up over time. Why, why, is it, why is it not perfect? Well, there's two reasons why it's not perfect. First of all, that my um, uh, detector has um, uh, dark noise. The bucket detector has dark noise. So sometimes it triggers the camera at the wrong time and the camera picks up a photon. There's residual photons flowing around the lab from the LEDs of the instrument switches. So sometimes a photon arrives and it's just got nothing to do with our photons. And then another reason you might have the wrong thing is that you've got two photon pairs generated by chance at roughly speaking the, 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 the same time. Uh, the, the detector is triggered by um, the first of the photon pairs, uh, and the, but the camera picks up a photon from the second of the photon pairs. And of course, they're not correlated, so they end up somewhere else. But nevertheless, it's possible to do this, this, this sort of um, coincidence triggering, let's call it. Uh, and, that, and that kind of system is, is enabled by this gated image intensifier. What it's really very good at doing, its false positive rate is, is, is quite low. Um, uh, and, and clearly one could work harder to make it lower by removing more background light and the like. Um, its quantum efficiency, however, is not, is not very high. By the time you've got your sort of delay line in there and all your filters, what you hoped might be a quantum efficiency of 15% is, is more like a quantum efficiency of two or 3%. Uh, and so most photons that are generated by the system go un undetected, um, just to put things in context. So let's have a talk about whether it's quantum or not. Um, I've already said it isn't, but let's think about ways in which it might nearly be or might be representative of being quantum. Clearly, it is a source which uses, it is a system that uses down converted light. In the system that I've shown you thus far, that down converted light um, is, is position correlated. Uh, I mean, in principle, I could sit there with two um, uh, quantum dot sources uh, move them, move them side by side, uh, trigger them both at the same time, move them, move them around randomly, and that would generate position correlated photon pairs. Um, you know, they would they wouldn't be entangled in any way, but they would be position correlated. Um, so let 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 let's think in a little bit 
more detail about some of these precise, you know, when I say they're correlated, well, by how much are they correlated, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going back here now to look exactly at the system that we've, that we've spoken about already. I'm just giving a little bit more detail. Uh, I've said that, the, um, that the, the plane of the crystal is imaged onto the plane of the object, not onto the plane of the bucket detector. It's imaged onto the plane of the object and that the plane of the crystal is also imaged onto the plane of the detector array in, 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 in the camera. Uh, and those two photons are going to arrive position correlated. And I, I was asking you or asking us to think about what is the strength of that position correlation. And it turns out that this is the formula at the moment, here at the moment. Uh, so that those two in the plane of the crystal Clearly, it might be different in the plane of the camera if my imaging system has magnification. But in the plane of the crystal, the correlation is given by that expression there. Uh, later on this afternoon, I, I may decide to, to derive that expression for you. Um, it, but I, I have a very bizarre way of understanding why that is the case or why it's not perfectly zero, uh, which I'm now going to share with you. And, and, then, and then over coffee, everyone can shoot me down as what a naive understanding it is, because it is. Um, but to me, there's something fundamentally interesting about quantum mechanics, which I've never really got my head around. And that is the uncertainty when I measure something's, posi something's position. That uncertainty in position, I can think of in one of two ways. I can think of it as a fundamental uncertainty in the universe, so to speak, that inherently thing has everything is a bit fuzzy. Or I can think about it as a measurement problem. Now, I know I shouldn't really think about it as a measurement problem, that I should really instead think about the fundamental fuzziness. But nevertheless, Given that the degree of fuzziness is often the same, then thinking about it perhaps incorrectly as a measurement problem um, actually allows you to calculate the right answer. Okay, oh, well, that's good. So why would I think about it as a measurement problem here? And I think the camera is quite a good question. If I just use the camera here to look back at the source, and ask myself, where did that photon come from? I would be completely comfortable classically thinking about the resolution limit of this optical system. And the resolution limit of that optical system depends on two things. One, one it depends upon the wavelength of the light that I'm using. And the other thing it depends on is the numerical aperture of my imaging system. Now, that tempts me to think if I really want to get a very, very tight correlation here, that I should be using very, very big lenses, as in large diameter lenses here and here. Because surely it is these lenses here and here which set the numerical aperture of my imaging system. And of course, they do set the numerical aperture of my imaging system. But my, the, the real numerical aperture cannot be more than what the light does. You know, if for some reason I'm only emitting light over a very narrow range of angles, then that is the numerical aperture that is going to set the resolution of the system. So what is that numerical aperture sat by here? It is set here by the divergence, shall we say, of the down converted light. And I, I've already spoken already that the, the angle over which my down converted light is emitted after the crystal depends upon the crystal length. And the, the shorter the crystal length, the bigger the angle. And the bigger the angle, the higher the resolution of my imaging system. And so you can see here, that's why the, the, the strength of the correlation is in some way dependent on the length of the crystal. The shorter the crystal, the tighter the correlation. It is some way dependent on the wavelength of the light. The, the, the longer wavelength gives me lower resolution, gives me poorer um, um, uh, correlation. And um, so I, I, I'll 
perhaps go into more detail about that later, but I just wanted to explain why it depends both on the length of the crystal and the wavelength of the light. Now, noticing incidentally, that if the length of the crystal was comparable to the wavelength of the light, then the strength of the correlation would be of order a wavelength, actually wavelength divided by the square root of six pi. Um, in reality, the length of my crystal probably is going to be at least a millimeter, so a thousand times bigger than um, the wavelength of the light, uh, and therefore the strength of the correlation, although it's tempting to believe is sub-wavelength, is, is typically not sub-wavelength at all. The strength of the correlation is many wavelengths, and in fact, often comparable to the size of the pixel in the camera, rather, rather, rather conveniently. So this, this strength of this correlation here is going to be ten, ten, tens of microns typically. So uh, that's what we're expecting to see. Now, as I've alluded to, but haven't properly described, I have an option when I do ghost imaging systems. I can, um, I can use, rely on the position correlation of, of the system, or I don't need to rely on the position correlation at all. I can rely on the momentum correlation. In this case, you can see now that my object is in the far field of the crystal. My camera is also in the far field of the crystal. Uh, it is anti-correlated, so the image is now inverted. So the image looks different. Here, our image was upright. Here, my image is inverted. And now we might also reasonably ask, well, what is the strength of the correlation in the far field? Well, the strength of the momentum correlation has nothing to do with the length of the crystal, you'll be glad to know, but it has everything to do with the diameter of the pump beam. So what's important is that the transverse momentum of the pump beam is equal to the sum of the transverse momenta of the two down converted photons. Now, in the case of my pump beam being directed along the optical axis, that transverse momentum of the pump beam is nominally zero. And so that's why we've been saying if one of the photons goes off to the left, the other one goes off to the right. However, obviously, because my pump beam is of finite size, then the transverse momentum of my pump photon also has uncertainty. And if the transverse momentum of my pump photon has uncertainty, the transverse momentum of the sum of my single and idler photons must also have uncertainty. And so if I want the correlation to be very, very tight, I need to have a very large pump beam. And that's why I said at the beginning that I was using a three millimeter diameter pump beam. It's not a pump beam focused tightly into the optical crystal, far from it. It is a collimated pump beam, and it is a collimated pump beam to minimize its transverse momentum uncertainty. And that's going to be true if you were, for example, wanting to do OAM entanglement. You, you do not want uncertainty in the transverse momentum of the pump. You want that to be uh, as reduced as much as possible. So that's collimated big beam. And you can see that the strength of the correlation, roughly speaking, is given by H bar divided by the beam waste in the, in, in, in the crystal size. So having said that we can configure our down conversion system in one of two ways. And in this way, we are relying on the position correlation. And in this way, we are relying on the momentum correlation. Clearly, I can actually do something which is akin to uh, loophole riddled <laughs> uh, EPR experiments where I can switch my optical system from using the image plane imaging to the far field. And at that point, I should see my image inverts, goes from being an upright image to an inverted image. And that is showing that I can utilize either um, the, the, um, the position correlation of the down converted pairs or the momentum anti-correlation of the down converted pairs. And if I was to somehow in some tour of technology, which would be really, really difficult and almost certainly not worth the effort, 
sort of switch randomly my optical system in the way that when one's doing a sort of, you know, a bell in a quality experiment, you randomly orientate the polarizers. Here in principle, I could randomly switch my optical system from being an image plane imaging system to a far field imaging system. And then I could essentially sort my detected photons into the two cases and show that in both cases I got an image, but one of them was inverted. You could, in principle, set up a, an EPR type um, paradox demonstration based on momentum and uncertainty. However, if all you actually want is an image of the object, then clearly either approach would be just fine. There is no reason whatsoever to switch between the two. So let us talk a little bit more now about how these down converted imaging experiments can be understood. And I would also say that I think it doesn't just apply to these down conversion imaging experiments. I think it applies to it applies to Bell inequality polarization type experiments as well. I mean, it applies to anything basically, I think, where you're looking at making coincidence measurements based on a photon down conversion source. So this is the, the system that you must be getting bored of seeing this slide by now. It is the, the down converted system whereby we are imaging the crystal onto the object and we are imaging the uh, crystal onto the uh, camera. I'm now going to make a conceptual change to the system whereby I replace the down conversion crystal with a mirror and I replace my bucket detector with a light bulb. And you can see that I've made an imaging system. This is now a completely classical imaging system. I illuminate the object. That object is re-imaged onto the mirror. Light bounces off the mirror, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And then the mirror is re-imaged onto the camera. And I have built an imaging system. And this is picking up on the ideas that I think were first put forward by this paper by uh, Pittman et al from the Xi group, two photon geometrical optics whereby I am essentially simulating, if you want to say that, the quantum system. Uh, the important thing being that these two images are effectively identical. If my light source has the same spectral properties as my down conversion source, I, it's a light source at 710 nanometers, I will produce some kind of image here uh, and everything will be uh, as predicted. Now, there's going to be a timing difference, okay? And this is the key difference with what makes it quantum. In this case, the photons arrive at the object and the image at the same time. And that's why I'm doing a coincidence count. In this case, my photon leaves the source before it arrives at the camera. Not saying anything very profound there. And so you can then get into all kinds of sort of little dances where you go, well, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm, if I want, I'm gonna run time backwards from the object to the mirror and then run time forwards again from the, from the mirror to the source. And this sort of really illustrates, I think very nicely, that you know, the spookiness of quantum is in the coincidence measurements. It's not, in the, it's not in the fact that I got an image, it's in the fact that in order to get the image, one needed to do something in coincidence, even though you're outside the light cone or whatever. But this is a really, really, really good predictor of exactly uh, the image that one will create. So if I wanted to know what will happen if I made one of those lenses smaller, the answer is exactly the same would happen to the quantum image here as happens to the classical image here. It would get blurry. If I restrict the aperture of one of these lenses, my upright image here will get blurry. Okay, if I restrict the aperture of the mirror, my imaging system will have a reduced field of view. Now, restricting the aperture of the lens is like changing the numerical aperture of the down converted light. And therefore, restricting the aperture of the lens would be like changing the crystal length. Restricting the aperture of the mirror would be like reducing the size of the pump beam. And so this classical system we have here allows us to predict what would happen to the quantum system, in this case, imaging, but not necessarily imaging. So uh, sort of hopefully just 
try to almost persuade you that what we've built there, at least conceptually, is a classical simulator of the quantum system. Now, before anyone thinks I'm making a claim to some classical, some underpinning classical physics behind quantum, clearly I'm not doing that. And I've explained why, because in my classical system, the emission time of light from the source is not the same time as the detection time at the camera. Whereas in the quantum system, the two detection times are the same time. It's a coincidence measurement, okay? But in terms of the quality of the images, then I'm saying that everything else follows. And I, you know, the way I always think about this is uh, in the case of the Bell inequality, the wonderful Bell inequality experiments where you've got the two polarizers and you're rotating them, sorry, you're rotating them in the two arms, let's do it that way, of the system. Um, in a sense, if one replaced one of the detectors with a light source, and one rotates the polarizer and holds the other one still, one gets sinusoidal fringes just as one would do in a Bell experiment. In fact, the, the, the sinusoidal pattern is exactly the same as you would get. It's just Mouse's law, for goodness sake. You're looking at light transmitted through rotating polarizers. The thing that makes it quantum is, of course, that the two detections are taken at the same time. So the, the classical simulator of a Bell inequality experiment would just be a Mouse's law in this, in, in this case. So I'm just saying again what I've said here, that in down conversion, the, the, the crystal is replaced in this sort of predictor, this classical simulator, the crystal is replaced by a mirror. Uh, and that applies incidentally, both in the imaging configuration, as I've shown here, but also in the far field configuration. If I built that imaging system in front of me, I would discover that my image was inverted with respect to the upright image I had before. Um, again, the bucket detectors replaced by a light bulb, the light bulb signifying it's big and extended, just as the, just as the bucket detector was. My, my crystal is replaced by a mirror. Sorry, we have a question. Yep. I'm listening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So uh, for me personally, it's still not very clear why you say that both the methods are the same, the quality of the image, like you showed the two images. For me, it looks a bit brighter when you have the position correlation. You had a slide where you showed the two images uh, far back. Oh, yeah. So in this case, for me personally, I would maybe choose the left side. I don't know how you analyze this data, but maybe there are some methods in which you cannot distinguish between the background and the image on the right, for example, or on the left is much easier to analyze this data. Again, I'm not familiar with this, but for me, the position looks better way of doing it. And I don't know why one would choose the momentum unless you gain something. Maybe that, 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 that's, that's a good point. And um, I agree with you, by the way, that I think the position measurement was slightly better here. If I remember rightly, it was because the quantum efficiency was actually slightly better. But I think that was to do with the technical setup rather than a fundamental sort of physics reason, we, i.e. we did one of the experiments better than we did the other experiment. Um, and, um, you know, when you start trying to do all the, these things practically, one discovers, of course, that in order to get similar magnifications, then one ends up using focal lengths of lenses that you'd really rather not have done. Either they're very, very long or very, very short. And so within any one particular configuration, it might be that the position uh, configuration is a more natural use of sensible focal length lenses than the momentum one or, or, or vice versa, depending on, 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 on the parameters. So, I mean, I think for me, the, the take home message here was not necessarily meant to be the quality of the images, but just essentially that one could see the difference between the position correlation leading to an upright image and the momentum and anti-correlation leading to an inverted image. Um, but, but thank you for pointing that out. And I've got, oops. So this next one here, okay, again, you're gonna see some slight differences in the quality of the images. This, this, this next slide here was effectively as doing exactly that. So the, the top row is a repeat of what you've just seen effectively. It's the upright and the inverted image. And once again, the, 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 the um, 
the the, the upright image looks a little bit better. Um, and then the downside was, so in our experimental configuration in that work, the bucket connector was actually a multi-mode fiber feeding the SPAD photodiode. And that was really convenient because we could unscrew the photodiode and screw on instead an LED. And so it was easy to change from the bucket detector to the light source simply by unscrewing one end of an optical fiber. Similarly, we did not actually replace the crystal with a mirror. What we did was just not use an anti-reflection coated crystal so that the light would bounce off the front surface of the crystal. And so the crystal was the mirror. All we had to do was turn the pump laser off so we didn't get any down converted photon pairs. And, and so what, what I'm showing you there, effectively nothing else is changing. So all the focal lengths and everything of the lenses are the same, all the filters are the same. Uh, and one can see, one, one generates equivalent images. Now, before, you, before anyone says, but hang on a second, actually the quantum images look a little bit better than the, the classical images meant to be the classical simulator. Why is that? So within the context of what I've just done, um, I'm looking at the time. Um, why, why is it that the quantum images actually look smoother than the classical ones? What is it about this that I haven't actually done in an equivalent fashion? And I'm going to leave that as a question for you all. And when, I, when my lecture, lecture starts, I think in, um, is it an hour and a half's time? I'm not sure. Either an hour and a half or two and a half hours. I can't remember. Um, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. So on that happy note, I will, I will pause and I will pick up again um, later today on exactly this slide. Thank you very much, Miles. Uh... So have we got a few minutes for questions just now or? Yeah, yeah, sure, yes. Are there any questions? Yes. Should I, you hold it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Um, okay. May, maybe my question is asking you for the answer to the question you just asked us, but I'm still not, an, I'm not really understanding the difference between the, the quantum, uh, why doing it quantumly while you could do it classically? I mean, I would expect, uh, yes. Uh, and I'm going to say, I'm not sure one would, in this particular thing that we're doing now, I'm not sure there is an advantage to doing it quantumly. Rather than, rather than classically, okay? What I'm trying to do here is really try and understand the physics of, quant of quantum and ghost imaging. And, uh, and I'm trying to find a way in which we can think about the problem. I think many people understand classical imaging better than they do quantum imaging. And what we're going to do is develop these, this analogy between the quantum system and the classical system as a way of predicting what the quantum system might do. Other questions? Uh, yeah, um, until now we only talked about degenerate uh, down conversion. So, where the photons have uh, the down converted photons have the same uh, wavelength. Is this classical picture also working for this unbalanced uh, down conversion processes? No. And indeed, doing an unbalanced process might be a reason why one would choose to do it in a quantum sense. Um, when I say no, there are aspects of it that worked and aspects of it that need to be thought about a little bit more carefully. Um, now, if your reflecting mirror was also a mirror that could change the wavelength of the light, then maybe there would be a classical counterpart. But on the other hand, a mirror that can change the wavelength of the light is probably even more te technologically complicated to make than, than having a down conversion source, which simply just produces light at two different wavelengths. So, so later on, I will show an example of a ghost imaging system, which is exactly as you imply, where the signal and idler are a different wavelength. And therefore you have the option of illuminating the object in the infrared, but recording the image in the visible. Other questions? So.
Uh, hi. Um, so what exactly uh, can we expect on the camera without any bucket detector? If there's no bucket detector, so... Well, if there was no bucket detector and no trigger, then essentially you would have no way of recording, of triggering, triggering the camera at the right time. So you would end up just recording, you know, the background light in the lab. Um, or if you did have a way of recording it at the, the right time, um, I mean, in, again, from a technological point of view, one could use a pulsed light source and then use a reference from the pulsed light source to trigger the camera. Um, and that would be, uh, that would be you know, the, the way to think about it. But you, you need to, you need to do something such that you were triggering the camera at the right time to collect the photon. Now, you know, the, the slightly nice thing, slightly nice about the quantum system is that that's not, if, you know, if it was a pulse laser, you'd be doing it every whatever, you know, at a particular defined metronome, click, 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 click. Whereas here, of course, we're, we're just triggering it as and when that the photons are generated. Um, and so it's sort of pseudo random pulse sequence would, would be the classical analogy. Um, um, so uh, if we have some triggering source, so would we get the same image? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that the, the classical simulator here that we've, we've shown in, in B and D, I think um, essentially produces the same image with the exception of the, you can see that the image quality is somewhat more speckly uh, for reasons mm. which, which, I've, which I've posed as a question because it took us a while to realize. Um, I'd be interested to see what people think. Why is the image in the bottom row more speckly than the image in the top row? I've told you all the filters are the same. It's a 10 nanometer bandpass filter. Oh, thank you. Okay. We have one more question. Actually, how does uh, non-momentum conserving scattering of the object affect your measurement? Well, that doesn't matter providing, it would matter if there was scattering between the object and the source, but it does not matter that the scattering between the object and the bucket detector in the same way that you could put a ground glass screen in front of a light bulb and you'd still get, you know, you could still use the same light bulb to do imaging. So as I'll talk about later, if you're going to put scattering in here, there's places you can introduce scattering, which it doesn't matter. And there's places you can introduce scattering where it does matter. Um, but before we get too excited, I don't, I don't think that there's a scenario where the quantum approach, or so we say, we'll call it the quantum approach, uh, gives you essentially a, a, a scatter immunity that the classical system wouldn't. You know, it's important to realize that even in a classical imaging system, one can, you know, you take perfectly good pictures with your camera, even when there's clouds in the sky, the fact that the sunlight scattered before it illuminates the object doesn't matter. If on the other hand, it's very foggy between you and the object, it matters rather a lot. Um, so, the, you know, the place where the scattering is matters. So in this case here, scattering between the object and the bucket detector wouldn't matter. Scattering between the object and the light bulb wouldn't matter. Scattering anywhere else in the system does matter. And I think that's true both for the classical and the quantum system. Okay, great. We have one more question here. Uh, so applications wise, it's unclear to me if there's like an advantage for the quantum version versus just classical imaging. Is there like a like a direction to go where this I, I think I, I think I think for ghost imaging, if there is an advantage, it's probably with the wavelength translation that we'll talk about later. Uh, in some of my other lectures with some of the other cameras, I think I am going to show you scenarios where there is there is an advantage to using quantum illumination compared to classical. So th th today I've just been wanting to talk about ghost imaging, because I think when people talk about quantum imaging, that's what most people think about. Uh, when my lecture, I think it's on Wednesday and again on Thursday, I'm going to not talk about ghost imaging. I'm going to talk about other kinds of imaging using uh, quantum correlated light sources where there is an advantage. 
Great. Let's thank Miles again. And I'll, I'll see you all in an hour. Is it an hour and a half? I'm back again, or is it two and yes. a half hours? Yeah, exactly. See you in one and a half. Great. Okay, Thanks, super cool. Guys. Lunchtime. Yes. Um, guys, for, for people who are, who are presenting a poster, please uh, put on your poster, hang on your poster to the poster boards. Uh, if you have questions or you needed anything like magnets, whatever, we are, we are around. So just ask for it. Thanks. And we meet again at 1.30 for the next lecture. Yeah.